Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. We have another great episode for you tonight. Uh, Mark Horton joining me to talk about front office economics and how those play out, uh, particularly for the Baltimore Ravens, who've had a very stable front office for years. And Mark, I kind of want to let you introduce some of your theories about this, because you always have some interesting things to say. The last pod you were on was just fantastic in terms of the uh, uh, the things we talked about. Lots of positive comments. Uh, that was on running back contracts. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to talk about front F- office economics and how front offices look at maybe some of the term of their decision making. So just before we get into that, I wanted to say I had a lot of fun doing the last show with you. And I had a lot of uh, good Twitter interactions via DMs with people after that show. So I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for putting in the work to build this platform in this community and then being willing to share it with some of us who aren't in the media space. It's a, it's a really cool thing you do. And I just wanted to say, I appreciate you having me on then and uh, having me back on for this one. Oh, my pleasure, uh, Mark. And uh, I look via this system to find the people who I'm going to have uh, as guests. Okay. Let's, let's talk about this a little bit. In a typical year, I do about 320 to 330 shows of those probably 320, all but 10 are done with me and a guest. And there, there are only a couple of people who do a regular show for me for with for 18, 20 weeks a season. So most of that is rotating guests. It's it's people who come on the show. And and I, you know, one time, maybe as many as four times in a year, maybe even a few people have really taken to it and they might do 10 shows a year. But nobody's doing, you know, five or six or seven percent of these total shows that I do. So it's really important to me to keep a, a, a pipeline of talent. Meeting somebody like you is a very big deal in terms of having somebody else to talk about football with. And I want to meet you guys out there. The folks who are out there, I want to meet you. I want to make it easy for you to get on here. I'm not trying to create a barrier to entry. I want you to want to come on. And maybe the best way to think about it is that I'm kind of like a talk show host that you can call on the radio. The mic is open. Let's talk about something you want to talk about that's interesting for an analytic football community and also just interesting uh, you know, in a fun way, uh, not necessarily always in terms of the analysis. But Mark, I really appreciate you coming on. And without you uh, and, and people like you, there wouldn't be a, a film study uh, platform regularly. I appreciate that. And by the way, uh, I've really been enjoying a lot of the other shorts too. So um, anyways, to the topic, uh, my theory is that a lot of front office economics are determined by GMs trying to keep their jobs, which is quite a hard thing to do in the NFL. And that the Ravens have had a lot of organizational stability um, because of some combination probably of who Ozzie Newsom has been and also maybe who the Ravens ownership has been. And I think that's allowed them to make some really savvy long-term decision-making and move, basically invest value now to value in the future um, in a way that a lot of teams have not been able to do. That applies to a lot of things, but but let's just talk about football for starters is that um, if you, if you have success on the field, which the Ravens have had, if you have a history of success in terms of your front off decisions, office decisions, or if you have a history of success as a coach, like say a Belichick Jack has, not only in winning games, but in generally making good decisions on the field, winning championships certainly helps. But um, you you build up a sort of currency in the bank that then you can expend making more risky decisions and still not get fired. And so you'll 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 notice a trend in Harbaugh, for example, that he was able to go to more fourth down gambling, more embracing of analytics in a in a very real way, you know more of just the philosophy of, of building an offense around Lamar Jackson that a lot of people considered risky at the time uh, that, that, you know, is built on his own job security already being there. And I think Newsom and DaCosta both have that. They both, in here, you know, been with the Ravens since the very beginning. Um, so I've often heard it said that in terms of draft picks, late round picks are lottery tickets. Unfortunately, DaCosta says this too. He doesn't really mean it that way. 
but I like to, I, I, you know, they are not just draft picks made by random people. You know, the Ravens believe that their chance to win with their World Series of Poker entries, which is the analogy I like to use, is better. You know, they've got Phil Ivey running running their draft room as opposed to me, who has also played in the World Series of Poker and has, you know, virtually no chance to win it relative to Phil. Uh, it's 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 a very different type of lottery ticket. It's really a a skill competition entry <laughs> that that they have. One thing that I actually really like about the Ravens is, you know, you could look at another organization like the Saints, and they also seem to have an edge on the league in terms of scouting. But I think sometimes they overplay it. So to go to a stock market analogy, you know. There are some people who make money by being smarter than everyone else, but that's really rare. It's really hard to make money by being consistently smarter than everyone else and arbitraging the fact that you understand the world and the market better. Now, the Ravens and a few other teams seem to kind of have that edge in football, but what the Saints have done with it is they've consistently made trades that on paper give away value in terms of trading up in the draft, which tends to be negative expected value, or trading from future years into current years, which tends to be a negative expected value. And they justify it by saying, we have this edge, we're smarter than everyone else, which they do in some cases. But despite the evidence that the Ravens seem to have a scouting edge, I think they've been very judicious over time about taking positive expected value trades in terms of trading back. And I think that's something really admirable where it's kind of been a check to evaluation over confidence, even if it's earned to some extent. Yeah. When, when it's offered, I think the Ravens have been very good about, about taking value. And generally speaking, when you can get a even or a little bit better JJ value trade, a lot of these are done by JJ value. Most of the other people who analyze the draft would tell you you're doing very well because valuation of players is much flatter than the JJ curve. So this is exactly what I want to speak to. Oh, go ahead. Um, <laughs> so the Jimmy Johnson chart was made a long time ago. It wasn't really analytically based. It was literally made by football coach and GM, I believe, Jimmy Johnson, um, because the league kind of needed some unified valuation of draft picks to decide how they were going to be traded. I think the the original chart was market-based. So they did actually look at trades that had occurred. But if you're tying yourself now to that over trades that were made 30 years ago, which is now the era in which the Jimmy Johnson chart was made, yeah, you could definitely see movement in that. And I think the general philosophical change has been to flatter is more accurate. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we talked about last show was that 2011 CBA, which really redistributed value over the whole draft. So for the purpose of my analysis, I went 2012, because that was when that 2011 CBA kicked in, to 2021, because that was the end of the data set that I found. Um, Great point, by the way, in terms of the CBA really matters. And it used to be the first round was highly peaked in terms of not only talent, which is still the case, but but in terms of salary mm -hmm. that those players would would receive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just to um, give a little bit of detail to this. Um, In the Jimmy Johnson valuation, pick 10 is worth 13 times as much as pick 100. You would need to trade 13 pick 100s to get one pick 10. Um, There's an organization called the Harvard Sports Analytics Collective, and they made a more analytically rooted uh, draft chart. They have the 10th pick being worth 3.18 times as much as the 100th pick. So 3.18 times versus 13 times as much is a pretty drastically different valuation of how much surplus value you're getting from these draft picks. Now, those are two different views from two different people. And my first question for the Harvard folks is going to be, how did you factor out for replacement level value? Mm -hmm. Because if they use things like AV, which Mm -hmm. is out there publicly, that's exactly includes, what they use. That, that includes a whole bunch of replacement value. So you can just basically throw that in the garbage uh, for the first couple of points, at least, of anybody's career. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's tempting to use AV because it's fairly well structured in terms of what it is. I don't think it ever values um, people who come in who don't start games mm-hmm. the same way 
that it, it, it judges the starters. And now we play this high leverage platoon, for example, at Dimeback, mm-hmm. um, where you, where if you don't recognize the value of those performers, you're, you're, you're probably missing out. But that, that is a, uh, uh, not recognizing the replacement level properly is a problem that basically everyone who's created new draft value charts has thrown their arms up and said, I don't know how to solve that problem. Mm-hmm. I haven't yet heard the, the the person. And I've had people on the show. Brad Spielberger has been on the show with, with the Spielberger Fitzgerald chart um, to talk about that. And they, they really, they don't have a good answer for that in terms of how do you factor out replacement level value? Sure. So I, I think there are a lot of cases where the analytics community should have a little bit of humility about these are legitimately hard problems. Mm -hmm. And the truth is probably somewhere between that 3.18 and that 13 number. But all of the analytics charts are quite a bit flatter than Jimmy Johnson. And what that seems to indicate is if you're using the Jimmy Johnson chart and you're moving up, you're paying a tax to do it in terms of value. And if you're uh, trading down in the Jimmy Johnson chart, you're probably accruing surplus value. Um, and then the other place where you can get super clear surplus value is trading back to future years because you're, uh, the team moving from a future year to the current year is all basically always paying a higher draft pick in order to do that. Yeah, and no, there's an enormous premium for trading for, for if when you're willing to trade into the future. It's interesting. Did you want to talk a little bit about how GMs may view that exchange if they have a ju- if they have a pick now and they're trading for a pick in the future? Yes, and even if you're trading up in the draft. So if you look at a lot of the players who are drafted in the fourth or fifth round, let's say, they're very rarely year one contributors, right? draft picks you're making a year from now are it's even going to be pushed further out before you actually see their contribution so but first rounders and maybe second rounders are the guys where you have an actual chance to see an a contribution to your roster this year and then the bpa formula that the ravens have religiously stuck to um also plays into this right Because if you draft for need, you're more likely to see a positive impact on your team right now, whereas BPA is almost always going to get you to the better long-term contribution. Yeah, need is a concession to value, very simply, is is the easy way to put it. And I think you did a good job there of explaining why. Mm -hmm. But the reason a lot of GMs will make this concession, in my opinion, is either evaluation overconfidence or even more likely job security, because if you feel like you're being evaluated for your team's loss win loss record every single year and you're on the hot seat, you don't have the time to make these long-term decisions that are moving value out to the future, even if it's producing more value to your team. Right. And, and it's, you, you, you can't use that on an exit interview either. And I'll, I'll point to the business world. As a, as a good analog for this, a good analogy, is that if you're a CEO of a company and you have a choice between two roughly equivalent options in terms of making, making less in the future, making more now, um, you'll always choose that one as opposed to making less now, making more in the future, assuming that the, the amounts are similar, because y- you know that you're going to be both responsible for that outcome and also bonus based on that outcome on your on your dollars that you're making now. So there there has to be almost like a if you were to come up with a way to value GMs like you could value CEOs with deferred income after they leave the, the company that pays them for the good decisions that they made while they were in the front office then, then maybe you could get them off that track. But neither, I, I, I haven't ever seen that done adequately in the business world who will probably be the first to solve that problem <laughs> just based on how prevalent it is and how many companies there are doing it. Um, as you know, And, and it, that really leaves no chance for a, for a sports team to figure it out in terms of how do you, a departing GM, how do you thank him? How do you give him money for the good decisions he made that put you in this position to succeed four years later. Funny enough, I think the Ravens actually found a way to do it for someone else's GM. <laughs> so Sashi Brown was the GM for 
the Browns, I believe in 2016 and 2017. Um, and he was very analytical, very business minded, kept trading back in the draft, kept trading uh, to future years. And I think it was a real admission of this team sucks. We can try to tank normally and pray that we're going to get a great QB who's going to save my job. But instead, he made very long term decisions, which I think really underlied the roster that the Browns have built now, which somehow still hasn't turned into a great team. But that's a complicated question. But he got fired after overseeing this zero win and this one win season, despite producing all of this value in the years after he was fired. And uh, funny enough, it was the Ravens who brought him in to replace Dick Cass's team president, which I think does speak to their culture and what they value. Now, I don't know um, what Sashi Brown's role is in terms of roster decisions and trades he, and things like that now. Yeah, he's, he's the, not on the football side. So he's 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 not a he's a business guy. Mm-hmm. And I think Sashi is a lawyer, if I recall correctly. That's I his, think that's, that's right. His, yeah, that's his background. But but, um, you know, Dick Cass, his job is trying to find ways to increase revenue for the team in various ways uh maximize and leverage what they could do with say sweet holders and sponsors and that sort of thing trying to sell the stadium out for army navy games for example would be a thing that that he would be involved in but dick Cass, as as i i've spoken to him at sweet holder events and he says that he's in the draft room but he usually just is sitting in the back and he used to say with modell at the time cracking jokes but he's not okay. he's definitely not involved in the selection process so uh uh it, it's a uh, yeah, I think that's where Sashi is right now. And I think, you know, it, with, he came to the Ravens and, and took over this president role that Bishotti would make the silos of responsibility very clear to him. Because if anyone really understands how not to create conflict within your organization and hire properly, uh, Bishotti is really a, a, a very good at that with his background. Mm. So I, I'm going to get into spelling out how I think the Ravens have made a lot of forward-looking decisions and accrued value doing that to stay a year-over-year contender. But my premise is that a lot of GMs don't do this because of job security. So I think one of the things that's really interesting is looking at the early years of um, Ozzie Newsome. So the Season in Between podcast on Exit 52 covered his first draft, which is a very famous one. And I learned some very interesting things. Um, One is that Jonathan Ogden, the first selection, future Hall of Famer, um, was actually a draft pick that the owner, Art Modell, really wanted to use on running back Lawrence Phillips. Yep. (laughs) And they'd had a five hour dinner together. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the things I always talk when we talk about that dinner is how often have you been on a five hour date where you didn't want that to lead somewhere else? So, <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a seriously would be a, a, a weird situation if that were the case. And, and thankfully, Newsom had the stones to effectively overrule, uh, you know, Modell in that situation, because Modell, uh, he, he would have he would have seriously backed up the organization by making that selection. Obviously, Phillips' situation since is well known. He ended up in prison and now he's dead. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, very unfortunate. But uh, but yeah, they, it's, uh, it, it was a, a very strange occurrence. Yeah. And um, I think even with the Ray Lewis selection, which was the next draft pick, there's an aspect of risking egg on your face because he was an undersized guy. Mm-hmm. And he was not really the prototypical linebacker. And I think a lot of teams were a little bit scared. Of, I, it sounds so silly in retrospect, especially with what the linebacker positions become since then. But I think there was a real element of risk taking and risking your reputation with that pick. And part of me wonders if Ozzy Newsom was empowered to do this by already having a Hall of Fame career in football and really having probably his legacy and his bank account well handled. Um, But I think he made two bold decisions really early um, that really risk your job security if you're wrong on them. But when you end up being right, I think build a lot of credibility. 
Yeah, Ozzy had an amazing streak of doing everything right in the first round and basically doing everything right via free agency in those years. I mean, the I don't I really would nominate the Ravens for the best accumulation of free agents up through about the 01 season that there's ever been in NFL history in terms of, you know, a number of consecutive deals really going right with, you know, McCrary, uh, Sam Adams, uh, Woodson, uh, Siragusa, Sharp. You know, it's, it's more than that. They, they, it started to go bad when they went to, they got to the Leon Searcy and, um, and uh, who's the quarterback? Uh, the 2001 quarterback. Not Cunningham, the other guy. Is that Bowler? No, Bowler's to 03. 2001, they, they signed Elvis Gerback. Okay. So I know it's a long time ago, but you were probably barely born then, right? <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's correct. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, please continue. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. No, you're completely good. And then uh, I don't think Ed Reed was like the most controversial draft pick, but it is pretty funny looking back at the column now um from the baltimore sun who's the baltimore sun reporter who's still covering Maybe preston the yeah the yeah. he wrote a column called a pick without pizzazz about ed reed <laughs> <laughs> I don't, read us do you have any portion of that that you could read us right now oh it's paywall then i'm not baltimore sun but okay. uh i i think i think the first line that i saw before the paywall kicked in was oh he has an accountant's name <laughs> or something <laughs> along those lines but um, you know, I, I think one of the fun things about being a fan and sports journalists probably have this issue too, is I want to yell and I do like, it's fun. Oh, this is an awful draft pick. This is so stupid. This is a great draft pick. They're brilliant. And I, I think that's like a fun part of being a fan and being in the media. But I think if you're going to really soberly look at it, you know, the Ravens have really earned the benefit of the doubt in a way that I think some organizations have and some haven't, but I think the Brandon Stevens draft pick was the first one in my time as a fan where I said, whoa, what the hell are we doing? Right. Um, and it looked very strange to me and it's still playing out and we'll see how it goes. But I think, you know, I don't begrudge anyone as a fan or as a member of the media being opinionated and putting it out there. But I think if you want to really look at the reality of the situation, um, instead of just doing the fan thing, it's worth taking a step back and saying, there's pretty smart people with pretty good reputations in this building, and it's probably worth letting it play out. I, I think you're right, by the way. I think that's the right way to look at it. And this year, uh, you know, even though I do a fair amount of work to try and relativize the players that are out there, uh, Caillou Kelly was a guy that I did not understand the reason why the Ravens were drafting him. He really had an awful statistical career at Stanford. And so you have to really ask yourself, does he, you know, what do the Ravens see in this guy? Mm -hmm. And, and it could be a case where one or even two scouts red starred him, you know, the, the, the famous red star that the Ravens have one per scout or maybe it's two per scout per year. They, they give out and they, uh, and, and they put on their board. Um, and, and they said, well, you know, look, Johnny and Eddie over here both liked him a lot. We should go with this. It's a fifth round draft pick. We need a, we need cornerbacks. And this is a guy they both have on the red star list. And I, I do question sometimes because I know I'm capable of it myself. If I look at a guy and I like what I see, but then I look at his statistics and I go, Ugh, those are terrible <laughs> in terms of particularly yards per target, just basic stuff like that. We're talking about a missed tackle rate, things like that. Things that don't show up on highlight films, for example, things that are very hard to find, even if you watch a couple of games, because the rate of them is still fairly low, you mm -hmm. know, like, like giving up really long plays or or um, uh, you know, missing tackles, drops for a receiver, that sort of thing. You have to you have to kind of check your own evaluator arrogance and own traits based scouting um, methodology to basically say, look it's true. There are things I like about this guy in terms of size and shape and whatever it might be, but, but it, there's just nothing to back this up from a statistical point of view. And, and he really underperformed in college. How am I projecting him to the pros at this level? And I, I think it's important for all arrogance to be checked along those lines. And I think it still is, it occurs still at the NFL scouting level that yeah. you do that. 
there have been some really interesting analytic studies where they look at consensus boards and then where draft picks are taken Mm -hmm. and they it's pretty demonstrable that when you pick a guy significantly above where he is on the consensus board it tends not to go well Mm-hmm. Like the Raiders have been famous for doing oh, yeah. this a lot. And I th- I think this is a pretty good example of organizational dysfunction. They wanted John Gruden so bad that they said, hey, we're going to give you a tremendous amount of control. I would, I love Shanahan. I would argue this about him as well. Um, and then he gets a lot of say in the early picks in the re- draft and they all turn into busts and they're all picked far above consensus with these like Alex Leatherwood types. And it's Mm -hmm. kind of tragic because the Raiders have gotten guys like Max Crosby in the later rounds where John Gruden's hands seem to be off of it a little bit more. But I think this is like a prime example of uh, evaluator arrogance. And it's, I think, especially dangerous when coaches are involved. Um, because they can really imagine the role for this guy on the team and how he fits in and slide into unprincipled decision-making. Just to go into two two additional components of the Raiders situation. The Raiders run what Pat Kerwin refers to as a strong coach system. Mm -hmm. And the general manager is, rather than a peer of the coach, is subservient to the coach. The coach says, here are the player types I need. And the GM still, you know, oversees scouting, oversees the, the probably the quote unquote final call in terms of who's drafted. But the coach, the coach says, look, I want A and B and C and D, and I want them in this order. Find me the guy I need here. Find me the guy I need there. Those are our two biggest needs, kind of thing. And you're basically you're making already within just what I've said a concession to need to mm-hmm. do that sort of thing. So go back to the Raiders. You, you mentioned Alex Leatherwood. I, I I don't even think that's nearly the worst example. Cleveland Farrell was a mm. guy who was thought to be a mid first round pick, probably even a late first round pick, you know, fifteen to twenty maybe would have been reasonable. And I think the Raiders had the number three or the number four pick, and I forget which it, which it actually was when they drafted him. But Mayock said, "I tried and tried to trade down there. Nobody wanted to trade up, and Mike." Response to that is somebody would have traded up if you'd offered the right discount on that. So the, the the team that holds the 15th pick, they'll trade, they'll they'll for sure trade up to number four if you cut the price in half. Yeah. You know? Well, and if your GM has autonomy, there's a BPA there. There's a best player there who's yep. not the guy you reached for, also, if yep. you really can't find the trade. So uh, and we have evidence that the Ravens don't do this because after the Ben Cleveland draft pick Harbaugh, not in an angry way, but he said, I was pestering Eric to trade up. I said, trade up, get me that guy. And Eric DaCosta wouldn't do it. So I think that's some evidence that the Ravens have a good process, even though John Harbaugh, I would imagine like every other coach has guys he falls in love with. And, you know, with the Ben Cleveland pick, it's starting to look like maybe it's a good thing they didn't trade up for him. Very important that they're separate silos. Um, you, you, first of all, you, it's as bad for a coach to reach in and say, I want this player at the college level, pick him, as it is for the GM to say, we're not letting you have the kind of authority you had, not, not that they would have this power within the, within the Ravens organization. We're not letting you have the authority to hire your own assistant coaches or your own coaching staff in general. We're going to pick your defensive and offensive coordinator for you. Mm. And you know, it's just it, it once you start taking hiring authority away, that's really what you're doing with the with the GM and taking his ability to his his uh, um, uh, freedom to, to mm-hmm. select the, the you know the player he thinks is BPA. Yeah, and I don't mind coaches having some part of the scouting process. Or even like maybe prioritizing a guy like David Ajabo because you know that he's produced well with Mike McDonald and you think you might be able to maximize him. I don't think like using coaches kind of like scouts is necessarily a bad thing as because they do have a lot of knowledge about football and where the team is. But I think it needs to be very carefully checked so that the coaches aren't running rampant in your draft room. You know, that's a great point. And I think it also goes in the other direction. I think... You know, when when RG3 was being sat down because he wasn't producing in Washington, and I forget who was the coach at the time, might have been Kubiak at the time, might have been somebody else, might have been Shanahan, I'm not sure who it was. 
I but think it was, was Shanahan. It was Shanahan. So they sat down. They sat down RG three, and he he just wanted to do it. And the 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 GM and maybe even the owner as well, uh, Snyder at the time said it's an organizational decision. And those things should exist at another level. For example, I mean everybody's constrained by the salary cap. That means you can't let the coach alone make a decision on what players are going to be on the field in the vacuum that is just ability. You need you need to do it in the sense that you you know we need to also maximize what we can do with the with the limited cap we have. To to that end, the best example I can give to do this is not the running back thing. It's it's platooning at weak side linebacker because I can tell you the Ravens did it for years and it is a position where you can save a ton of money by having three players or two players do the job of one and do it for a hell of a lot less than a three down unicorn can do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's decent reason not to do it now with Patrick queen in the building, but I think Mm -hmm. that is a pretty principled decision most of the time. Um, so could I get into a little bit of a Go. numerical argument about wh- what the Ravens have done in terms of the draft and where they've looked for value? So Please. I picked this period from 2012 to 2021, like I mentioned. So one area where you can look at long-term thinking where the Ravens have been pretty exceptional is compensatory draft picks. If you can wait past that initial free agency period where you're going to have to pay market price, but you can potentially get these really high impact players, then you can hold on to your compensatory picks. And it also helps that the Ravens are really good at developing players who are actually eligible for compensatory picks. But um, most teams or the NFL's averaged per team about one compensatory pick per year. The Ravens have averaged 2.3 compensatory picks per year. So a lot more than the rest of the league. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of value. Mark, let's go back to why does that happen? Why would the Ravens be able to get 2.3 picks per year when everybody else is only getting one on average? Well, the average is like two reasons. One, they're not making desperate free agent signings early to try to save their team, which screw with the compensatory pick formula. And Two is they're developing players really well who are getting second contracts who are then eligible for the compensatory formula. Okay, I, I agree with both those statements. I think it's more the second one, though. Oh, well, it's probably just as much the the, the, the first and the second, but that, that they not just develop, but that they draft exceptionally well. And it is the curse of a great drafting team that you end up having to make these heartbreaking decisions about your homegrown players and let them go. And, you know, it, Matt Judon was particularly salty about being let go by the Baltimore Ravens. And he said a lot of things after he left town that I think maybe someday he's going to regret. Maybe not. Um, But it's, is, is, are the sorts of things that basically don't take into understanding what the Ravens organizational philosophy really needs to be that they, they cannot afford to sign everybody. And we saw with that great 2018 draft, for example, that they actually went beyond that. They didn't even wait for the for the compensatory periods for the compensatory picks to kick in on these players. They traded a lot of them early to try and um, get some value return on the uh, on their fourth year. Generally speaking, with players like Brown and and um, and uh, Brown and Brown, Brown and Brown, and then also also uh, 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 Hurst mm-hmm. earlier after after two years. Mm-hmm. With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you with fast, chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. If you're too busy this fall to cook but want to make sure you're eating well, then get Factor. This, guys, this is what I did. We were moving, packed up. Packed up all my dishes, everything needed better meals. I signed up for Factor, it's best meals, probably the healthiest I've eaten in a month thanks to these Factor meals. Because with Factor, you can skip those extra trips to the grocery store and the chopping, the prepping, the cleanup, all while still getting flavor and the nutritional quality you need. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. So all you have to do is heat, enjoy, and then get back to crushing your goals, which for me was trying to move. But now I can't, I need them for work 
at lunch every day. They're perfect. So this September, get faster and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes. No prep, no mess. So head to factormeals.com slash ravens50 and use that code ravens50 like I did to get 50% off. That's ravens50 at factormeals.com slash ravens50 to get 50% off your factor meals. As a better, you demand perfection. And my bookie delivers. NFL, college football, and a brand new cash out system gives you options to bet and win all season long. If the first two legs of your parlay hit, cash out early and use those funds for another bet or let it all ride for a chance at an even bigger payday. Join the MyBookie family for an entire season filled with odds boosts, free bets, and super contests. This season, MyBookie has a no-strings-attached cash bonus that lets you deposit and withdraw quick. Use the promo code RAVENS on a deposit of $50 or more, and you can receive up to $200 in cash instantly to your MyBookie account. Bet your deposit amount once, and you're ready to cash it out at any time. Again, that's promo code RAVENS to claim your cash deposit bonus. You can bet anything, anytime, anywhere, only with my bookie. Film studies brought to you by GoPuff. GoPuff is a delivery app that offers super fast delivery of anything you need. Their simple to use app lets you order your favorite brands and products right to your door in 30 minutes or less. No middleman, no crazy fees, and no waiting around. GoPuff has literally everything you could ever want. Get snacks, drinks, groceries, alcohol, home essentials, and more delivered with a click of a button. For a limited time only, GoPuff is giving new customers $10 off their first 10 orders, plus a free 14-day trial of their exclusive membership program by using the code WELCOME1010. GoPuff's membership program gets you access to unlimited free deliveries with no service fees. Extremely low pricing on over 150 everyday essentials like eggs, milk, Ben and & Jerry's, and more, and insane weekly deals on the most coveted and in-demand brands and products. So download the GoPuff app or visit GoPuff.com and use the code WELCOME1010 today. Sure. And this even plays into like the, the Orlando Brown trade, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you hold him for an extra year, then let him hit free agency. He is going to produce a compensatory pick. So when you trade him to the Chiefs and you get a first round back, that compensatory pick is part of what's getting rolled into the value that the Chiefs are giving to you in effect. Um, y- yes, it's it was like a mid second was the the JJ equivalent of what they got in exchange for Brown is the way to I, I it's the way I think of it. I don't know if it's sure. the correct way to think of it, but but it's the it's uh it was substantially more than the compensatory pick, and the compensatory pick also is deferred, so it would have been two years uh, hence, but they would have also got one more year out of Brown for the for that price. Mm-hmm. Okay, so moving on to my thesis that there's a lot of uh, value in the mid rounds in particular mm-hmm. um, that you can exploit if you're willing to wait a little bit longer to develop players. So in that 2012 to 21 period, um, the average team drafted about one time in the first round. The Ravens drafted 1.1 times on average. In the second round, the average team drafted about one time. The Ravens drafted about 0.8 times. In the third round, the average team drafted about 1.12 times or 1.16 times, excuse me. It's a little bit higher because because there are compensatory picks picks in that round. Yep. The Ravens drafted 1.8. In the fourth round, the average team drafted uh, about 1.2 times. The Ravens drafted 2.3, so Hmm. almost twice as much as the rest of the league. And then the fifth round, 1.14 for the league. Uh, 1.3 for the Ravens, sixth round, 1.2 for the league, 1.3 for the Ravens. The only round where they're drafting substantially less than other teams is the seventh, where that average team is drafting 1.22 times and the Ravens are drafting 0.6. And my theory is twofold. One, that they have a lot of, uh, they're a very attractive spot and good at developing UDFAs. And two, they really like these sandwich trades. So it's like my first and my seventh for your second and third, let's say. Okay. 
I think that could be part of it. I'll give you another reason is mm -hmm. that they're masters of the compensatory pick formula and they still want to sign some free agents. And so if you, if you know what you're doing, you can sign towards the bottom and only give up those lower rounds, sixth and seventh round picks that are offset in the formula. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, they're, they're probably good about not offsetting players who would result in third or fourth round picks. Mm -hmm. So another piece of this is according to that Harvard sports analytics collective analysis, the Ravens tended to trade back. They weren't quite at the top of the league in terms of trading back, but they tended to trades later and towards middle rounds. Um, and something that surprised me is they traded slightly from the future to the present. Now, I looked into the specifics of this. So this is the opposite of what I would have expected because they are a very forward-looking team. And one of the ways you can create value in the future is by accepting these trades where it's someone else's next year's fifth, four year, sixth this year, let's say. Um, but part of that was the Lamar Jackson trade where they pulled picks or at least one pick from the future. Yeah. Um, and even the analytics folks tend to concede if you're going to trade up, trading up for a quarterback is probably a good idea because they have so much ability to create surplus value. Um, and I don't think there's a pattern of trading from the future, really. Well, the other time they traded up, that was a very big deal. Actually, they did it twice. They did it for Bowler. Mm. And, and so they, you know, they traded a, a first for next year, which ended up being Vince Wilfork plus their, their second round pick from the, from the 2003 season. Uh, hard to really pin Brian Billick down on that discussion, by the way, I've, I've, I've had an opportunity to question him a couple times ab about the kind of thing. And it's like this third person experience now to him. It's not his, his call or his, his request or anything anymore. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, oh, wait, yeah, they just felt like we had uh, blah, blah, blah kind of thing. It's just, it's a, it's, it's a third person kind of a thing. It, the the second person they did for is Flacco. And a lot of people don't remember, they traded back from their pick, but then they also traded forward again to get Flacco. So they moved, I think they moved from, might've been six to 24 and then back up to 18 to get him, something mm -hmm. like that. So uh, they've they've definitely, they've moved up to take a quarterback a couple of different times. And uh, I, 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 the other ones that I remember are, are some players like uh, Terry, they traded two thirds, I believe, to get into the second last pick of the second round to get Terry, a left tackle. Well, do you want to know something pretty funny? Sure. The Ravens have been very principled where almost the only times you're trading up are for quarterbacks, which is like kind of among the analytics community, the consensus smart thing to do. The exceptions um, where they traded up for non quarterbacks in recent history were. Miles Boykin and Arthur Brown. So it seems like Ooh. the universe has <laughs> a little bit of a sense of humor punishing the Ravens for bad process. There you go. There you go. All right. Uh, roll this forward a little bit. Now maybe tie it together for us or, or, or take us into the next point here. Are, 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 you know, it, it's, it's, it, it seems like, in general, that the that the Ravens' long term outlook should certainly benefit them. It seems like they've been stable enough to implement it over a long period of time. But what other thoughts do you have about the about that process? Well, one of the things that stability affords you is the ability to develop a successor, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you're the CEO of a company, but you're on the hot seat. You're probably not trying to groom a great replacement for yourself. Right. Um, but we, we, we have a saying for that in the business world. You get, I don't think he's the kind of CEO who gets to name his successor. <laughs> so if you're, if you're, you know, if you're failing, if you're flunking out, you don't get to name your successor. You make it to retirement. You get to name your successor possibly. Sure. Um, but Ozzy Newsom was a GM who got to name his successor <laughs> with Eric DaCosta. And I think Eric DaCosta has continued a lot of the positive trends Although there are a few noteworthy exceptions where he seems to believe that he has an advantage over the rest of the league and be a little bit more willing to take risks. So, for example, they gave up a compensatory pick to sign uh, Marcus Williams at market value. And notably, uh, Eric DaCosta in an interview said that he believed that 
the rest of the league was undervaluing safety and tight end play. So there is an element of we think we're outsmarting other people. Um, I It seems like they have a thesis about drafting DBs that's pretty recent, and I don't know exactly what it is, but they've been more willing to make draft picks, which at least appear to be reaches, and Brandon Stevens, Pepe Williams, and uh, maybe Caillou Blue Kelly. I yep. actually have a theory about what this is, by the way, but I'm not sure whether I'm right about it. Would have been nice if this thesis led them to to reek woolen, but you know, um, I I think what they might be doing this is purely speculative. I heard Eric DaCosta in an interview talk about how they really feel like they'd improve their process for interviewing players and asking them questions, and I could, if you look at all of the DBs they've drafted recently, um the consensus seems to be they're really mature guys. They give really good interviews. They seem pretty cool headed. Mm -hmm. So maybe a big part of the thesis here is it's really hard to develop as a DB if you don't have the right personality traits and they're scouting more heavily on personality traits than other teams. But this is purely speculative and it's just something I could imagine, which might explain some of these apparent reaches. You know, that's a that seems like a very reasonable H zero. Very reasonable. Uh in terms of 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 you know what what could be the reason. Uh I I think you'd have to come up with some counterexamples for that. But you know, I, I'll just plug the the show we had with Jeremy Lucian recently. Mm -hmm. Uh very smart guy uh who the Ravens have asked to play safety. He's only been doing it for a little bit here, but uh, you know, a, he's a UDFA, but he's a, he's a speculative UDFA at that in terms of a guy who um, they obviously hope can pick up another position or decided that he wasn't a fit for corner and he'd be a better fit for safety. Um, and I, I, I got to believe, based on just talking to the guy, that, that, that he would interview very well with yeah. a team in terms of you know how, he, how you'd uh, want to you'd want to like the guy and you'd want to want to think that his his smarts would be able to pick up another position easily and i've never heard our darius washington interview but just watching him play football you have to think he's a very smart guy because especially in college he was just the most instinctive ball hawk just manufacturing mm -hmm. interceptions without athleticism to speak of almost at all so um i think it seems like he probably fits that too um and then something that i've thought was really noteworthy and positive in the Eric DaCosta tenure in terms of taking value in the present and moving it to more value in the future and really taking risks to do it was trading away Orlando Brown Jr. and Hollywood Brown. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at it from the long-term perspective, wow, you got multiple years of good play out of that guy. And then you got the same draft pick or a higher draft pick back on the last deal or on the last year of their deal. Um, there was a real cost to be paid in that while you were in this contending window, you gave away key contributors, but those moves I think were essential now where even with Lamar Jackson under contract, those could be reasons that you still have the ability to, to contend because they give you the ability to bring in a cheap, high quality talent for a number of years. So I think if you look at it from a pure value perspective, they're both great trades. And I think if you look at it from a job security perspective, they're both dangerous moves, especially trading Orlando Brown to the Chiefs. Yeah. That That's the one. Um, the, the Brown trade was worse. And, you know, frankly, uh, you know, they didn't, uh, DaCosta did not really get a trip to the woodshed from Ravens fans for that 2021 season going so poorly. Uh, because I think people realized that even with Brown, it still wouldn't have been good enough. Probably, it that, was that, such horrendous injury yeah. luck. Yeah, it was. It was. It was truly terrible. And it, I mean, the loss of Lamar Jackson was the the cherry on top of the cake. Unfortunately, in terms of a cherry on top of the crap sandwich, is more like in terms of that season for Ravens fans. But uh, you know, it's it 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 made that trade a good thing in the same way that while I love Roquan and I think that the signing of him, I'm very happy with in terms of leading the defense, the actual trade for Roquan at midseason last year wasn't a good one for value. I mean, they, they, they traded, you know, a second and a fifth. They basically over 
overpaid in terms of draft capital because they were they're paying for the the Bears to pick up contract responsibility for 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 some of the dollars. So it's a it's multifaceted bad thing. Now it happened to work out. They got the contract done during the regular season, and that was big. And maybe they wouldn't have had the same chance to sign him during the off season, or you know you could take the opposite view that maybe they had you know obviously the big difference in 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 picking up Roquan at all was that they thought Roquan would be a better player than he was for the bears as a Raven. And they were completely right about it. But I think Roquan would have gotten to free agency. I don't think he'd have been a $20 million man because the best play he's ever had is the last half season with the Ravens. So that clearly increased his value. So the Ravens would have had a chance to sign him maybe for 16 million per year. And he could have been a, uh, you know, a guy during the offseason that they didn't have to invest draft capital in instead. And obviously the 2022 uh, having Roquan for the season ultimately did not pay off in terms of a playoff win because of the loss of the quarterback again. Yeah. And like with some of the seeming reaches at DB, I kind of want to put the Roquan Quan Smith trade in the same category, which is based on what I know about football it seems like a negative expected value play. Mm -hmm. Now the Ravens really might see something and be ahead of the rest of the league, maybe in terms of positional valuation or who Roquan Smith is or any number of things. And I want to give it a few years to play out, but they do seem to be sticking their neck out thinking they know something that other people don't. And I mean, the early returns on Roquan are good, but that looks more like luck so far. Um, maybe in a few years, the rest of the league will say, oh, wow, we've been undervaluing high end linebackers and safeties, let's say. But um, yeah, that both of those had me scratching my head a little bit. And I'm curious to see what it's going to look like with more hindsight. Yeah, well, I, I, we, we will see how it plays out. You know, the easiest thing to say, the easiest way to frame this up is it's probably at this point going to look great as long as Roquan doesn't get hurt for any protracted period. But if he plays out his contract healthy with the Baltimore Ravens, they're going to comp- they're going to get every nickel worth of value out of that contract. So, would you agree with my assessment that Eric DaCosta leaves a little bit more room for risk taking and evaluator confidence or overconfidence <laughs> i guess it depends on whether it works out or not but it seems to me like there's been not like new orleans saints levels nearly but a little bit more risk taking that we know something everyone else doesn't and we're willing to act on it i mean obviously the brandon stevens pick is a big one that that comes to mind the ben mason pick a big one that that obviously looks like it's failed at this point in terms of of taking someone and saying there's nobody else in this draft that we even like uh i i think there are there there, there's certainly you can point to individual instances i have a story about this going backwards and it was the year i'm going to try and remember what the year was um before i say this story exactly because i want to get every detail correct about it but i wouldn't know who the player is and okay, it is the 2009 draft. Okay. And so Eric DaCosta basically was at some event where he was talking about what can you, you know, what was the thing they saw in each of their draft picks? So he went through, he talked about Michael Lord, he talked about Paul Kruger, he talked about Lardarius Webb. And by the way, Webb, huge small school pick. Um, he, he was fairly highly regarded, but, you know, he went to nickel state. He didn't, he hadn't played division one football, um, you know, let alone power five football, uh, at all. And, and so, you know, it was kind of a, a risky pick. A lot of people liked it, but a lot of people didn't like it also. And, and, and I think it pretty clearly worked out in terms of value, but then the guy, the guy that he went down to is Devon drew was their fifth, second, fifth round pick He's a tight end from East Carolina. When asked about that pick, he said he was really Ozzy's guy. Hmm. That is an interesting thing to say because we think of these two people as being two incredibly, you know, co-op- cooperative, certainly, but but more um, um, uh, <laughs> how, how would I say what, what are the words I would use? 
um, symbiotic is maybe a, maybe a, a term I would use, but maybe two, two people that I expect to not only to collaborate on the move, but also to keep quiet about what the in-house reasons are why they drafted somebody. They're certainly not talking about an individual scout red starring these players. Well, you know, three of our 19 scouts had him red starred. In fact, they don't even really like to tell you at all who had a red star uh, after the fact. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, but it's interesting because he, he, he specifically said Devon drew and there's a tight end. He was really Ozzy's guy. Uh, I just, I, I, you know, it, it, it anyway, that, that, that's the, the, the story I have to tell about that. And I think that, that, uh, um, the, the, I guess the point I'm making is that while DaCosta was in charge of all the small school scouting at that time and had a, no doubt a very significant hand as a, a facilitator, collector of information, and a suggester to Ozzy. Ozzy had the final say in some things, and he made some picks that 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 DaCosta didn't necessarily agree with. But I do think for anybody to say that the Ravens draft situation is completely detached from Eric, Eric DaCosta in the years 1996 through 2018 are fools. Mm-hmm. I mean, DaCosta was a big part of that of that entire process. Um, and I still think that it's likely Ozzy is a pretty significant, at least a sounding board for DaCosta now in his years since living in the GM role. A, a draft pick that terrified me, which ended up being really good, actually, I think, was Isaiah Likely, because mm-hmm. what came out right after the draft was, oh, Steve Bashotti brought this guy in and Uh-oh. said, <laughs> have you checked out this kid from Coastal Carolina? But I, I think he probably ended up... Uh, where he was supposed to be on the draft board, according to everyone's opinions. Cause I don't think that was a crazy draft pick at all in hindsight. But when I heard that, I'm like, wait, Steve Bashotti scouting now what's going on there. <laughs> Everybody's allowed to have their opinions, of course. And, and Steve does a wonderful job of leaving the organization alone, setting rules for how it runs, but not telling people how to make their individual de- decisions and hiring good people and letting them do their job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's probably more about how it was represented or spoken about uh, externally because there's a big difference between Steve Bashotti told me to draft him and Steve Bashotti said, hey, have you checked out this guy? He seems cool. And then everyone mm-hmm. scouted him and liked him. But I just, that one was funny to me because it scared me in the moment. And now I'm a big Isaiah Likely fan. So not too much problem with that. Um, Two of the interesting draft picks, I think, in the Eric DaCosta era to me, are Adafe Owe, because he's a guy who risks egg on your face. I think there are great reasons to draft him, but if you draft the guy who had zero sacks in college and he ends up being a bust, you look like a real idiot. Mm-hmm. Um, David Ajabo is really interesting because he's not a trade back to a future year, but he in effect kind of is mm-hmm. because you're not going to get any real contribution from him year one. In my opinion, you know, I'm optimistic, but I think his contributions this year are probably going to be pretty limited because he didn't have last season. But in those last two years, you're more likely to get the payoff for your um, second round pick where you drafted a guy who might've gone 15th overall. And then you have some option value at the end with a franchise tag or trade value at this really premium position. So that looks to me like one where they're moving value into the future. And then Voorhees is an even weirder one from this year because they took value from the future to make less value in the present, to make more value in the future by drafting a guy who uh, wouldn't be ready for a year. So I think that's another one of those, like when you draft an injured player who fell because they're injured, you are moving value to the future and probably getting a premium to do it but they traded a future draft pick to do it, therefore giving away some of that value. Yeah. It, the, the the thing there is that they traded a sixth round draft pick to get a seven. And mm-hmm. yes, there's probably a 10 to one relationship in terms of JJ points between the sixth and seventh round. Literally it might be 10 and one between those two draft picks that were, that were involved in the thing. They got them from the Browns. This is not only I, the, the, it's incredibly unlikely that the Browns, will be taunting the Ravens with whoever they get with that sixth round pick, the, the, the Ravens trade. It's possible, but 
Babatunde Oshinowo. If you know that name, that's the guy, the sixth round pick they got from allowing the Ravens to move up from 13 to 12 to, to take a loading Nada. Sure. So, so it's, uh, I don't think the Browns are going to be going to be, it, it's very unlikely. They'll pick a guy in the sixth round who's so good that they can wave that flag. I think it's much more likely that the Ravens will be able to have a successful offensive lineman with the way they've groomed them here um, out of worries who starts for three years with the team say, and is one of the really powerful offensive linemen of the year based on, on, on his bench press and all the things we saw already indicating he's got his grown man strength ready to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm not even critical of the Browns to the extent that you are. I think, I think even if it pays off for the Ravens, um, it's still probably a pretty principled decision from the Brown and the, from the Browns and they're turning some profit off of it. I think that's a bit harder when it's a Lodi and uh-huh. maybe a future hall of famer, but um it was also a, moving from 13 to 12, I think should cost you maybe 50 or a hundred in terms of JJ capital, maybe 50. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and if you think about that, that's, that's probably more like a bottom of the fourth, top of the fifth kind of level of value. And they, they, they accepted a sixth, which was, seems like it's just not nearly enough. Mm-hmm. So I think one of the really interesting things to talk about is the project that Ozzie Newsom was really doing upon his departure, which is a complete money ball approach to offense, in my opinion, and a pretty radical and risky experiment in roster building mm-hmm. that, in my opinion, paid off very well. You got an MVP, you had the best team in football that happened not to win a Super Bowl, and then you had contenders for a few years, which kind of fell apart due to injury, but there's not that much you can do about that at the end of the day. Um, but really just saying, screw the wide receiver position. Um, everyone else in football values it and wants to go through the pass, even kind of screw the outside zone trendy run game. We're going to collect giant bodies on the offensive line. Then Nick Boyle and Patrick Ricard, who are elite at what they do, but not particularly highly valued, good pass catching tight ends Mm -hmm. and just beat everyone down with a power run game that all these rosters have shifted away from being able to defend And then draft really a generational talent in Lamar Jackson, who no one else was really willing to build a team around. And as a Ravens fan, like even looking to this offseason, you know, when he was on the non-exclusive tag, I was expecting teams to come swarming in because of how highly the QB position is valued. And I don't even think... I'm of the opinion that he doesn't need to be in a Greg Roman type of system based on what he did in college and based on how he put the team on his back in 2021 when there wasn't really the infrastructure for a run game. But I think it's nice as a Ravens fan, depressing as a Lamar Jackson fan, that no one else was really willing to take the organizational risk and... Uh, kind of reorient their team around the special abilities he brings to the table. But, you know, I've loved being a Ravens fan and getting to watch it from that side. Well, I, I have too, of course. And, and uh, uh, you know, get, getting your own players back at a reasonable price is always nice. I think that, you know, the Lamar price was, was high, but it wasn't as high as the Watson cost. It wasn't as outrageous as that. Or the Herbert not, cost since then. Or, or or the Herbert cost, except that I'm also going to roll in probably 10 million of the Odell Beckham money into the Jackson contract and say the Ravens never would have paid that in a million years. Fair if, enough. It's it's not that that's not the Ravens' way to do that. So you're you're you know, when you talk about that, you're you're right there with Herbert in terms of the money and a year earlier, right? A year earlier? No, same, same year, same year. Mm-hmm. Same year. Um, anyway, the, the, uh, um, I forgot what I was going to say here. This is, uh, taken off, off track a little bit here. Yeah. The, the funny thing about it is other teams now have looked at what the Ravens have done and, and did do try and duplicate it in some ways, you know, the, the Philadelphia Eagles in a lot of ways, Jalen hurts is quite similar to Lamar mm-hmm. Jackson in terms of, of, uh, trying to, to fit that same thing. And some people would say, oh, that's the Russell Wilson way. Well, no, it's really not. You know, the 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 read option to the degree it's been done with Jackson and Hertz is very different in terms of uh, you know the the uh, the prevalence of that and the, those two offenses. I mean, 
I don't want to hear about points. I really don't ever want to hear about yards. I want to hear about points per drive mm -hmm. because that's the metric which you can reasonably compare offenses on. Uh, and that not only did the Lamar Jackson offense deliver on that in 2019, as only four other teams ever have, but they also did so by keeping fresh a defense with a very greatly reduced opponent snap count that helped them be better. So it was really a case where Jackson was making all 22 players better or all mm -hmm. 21 others. Well, yeah. And it was not only arguably the fourth most efficient offense of all time. It was at like a negligible price tag. Oh, yeah, I nothing. think they had yeah. the cheapest offense in the league because they were choosing to value all of the things that the rest of the league didn't, which is a really polarizing, dangerous bet. But man, it at least paid off for one season. And in my opinion, really did for two or three. Revolution Baltimore. That was uh, that was there. And, and the Ravens, they, they might not be done getting paid off from that draft pick in the sense that even though they had to pay market value for Jackson on a second deal, but in the sense that it's those market frictions which helped him stay in Baltimore. If he was truly free to go anywhere at the end of five years, as he will be at the end of 10, mm -hmm. then uh, you know it'll be a whole different ball game in terms of trying to re-sign him and in terms of the leverage he has to move elsewhere. So those frictions really helped. Sure. It's just so crazy to me that you can give up like, what, four first round picks to pay Deshaun Watson an unprecedented contract and you can't pay two um, for Lamar on probably a more reasonable contract. That's that's what blew my mind. When mm -hmm. they put the non-exclusive tag on him, I really thought teams were going to come rushing through the door based on what happened with Deshaun Watson. There were, there were people who thought in the national media that if you traded him on draft day exactly, since that's the one day per year that you can trade ahead four years in mm -hmm. terms of draft picks, that they might actually get four number ones for him. Mm -hmm. It's... Uh, uh, it's it's actually kind of funny, you know, in, in uh, thinking about it in the past. But hopefully, you know, the the Lamar signing is one that the Ravens never look back on. That Ravens fans treasure in terms of this. I know I'm very happy to have the entire experience be done with. It's very nerve wracking to to you know be going through that where it, your quarterback is not indicating that he wants to stay here for the rest of his career. And your general manager is saying, we're going to, we love Lamar. We want Lamar, but it's got to be at the right price kind of thing. It's just that mm -hmm. it's a scary proposition. Well, and I'm a big Justin Herbert fan. I think he's a heck of a quarterback. I would be scared if I were a Chargers fan right now. And mm -hmm. the story's not written yet, but I don't think they have quite that same history of sustainably assembling rosters. So if I'm going to be a fan of any team that's paying their quarterback over the long term uh, near market value and believe that they have a shot to contend, it's the Ravens who really have built credibility, building rosters through the draft and pushing value out into the future and investing. Uh, Mark, we've been a little over an hour here. We need to kind of kind of gather the threads together here. And is there any kind of final point you'd make with regard to this in terms of uh, what other teams should be looking most to maybe emulate in the Ravens system? I think it's the philosophy of taking value now and looking for more value later. And I think in particular, owners need to be really cognizant of incentivizing instead of punishing GMs for doing it, instead of just looking at what's your win-loss record this year. Um, and additionally, I think evaluator humility. I think there have been some exceptions recently, but the Ravens have gotten really good players by picking kind of the right guy out of the mix of guys in that consensus band, rather than saying, we got it, we're picking a guy nobody's ever heard of which seems to be a stumbling block for a lot of teams, even who do have really talented scouting. Yeah. All right, Mark, outstanding. Always a pleasure to talk football with you. We could probably spend two more hours on this topic, except we can't spend two more hours on this topic. <laughs> uh, tell folks where they can talk football with you. Uh, I'm on Twitter. My DMs are open, so feel free to shoot me a message. And uh, you want to give me your Twitter handle? 
I forget because it's the auto-generated one and it has okay. like 10 leading numbers. Don't worry about it. It'll be tagged in the podcast itself uh, as as uh, who's doing this with it. So I'll, I'll promo this on Twitter. You can find Mark that way. Uh, other folks out there, I really mean what we said at the outset of the show. I, I want to hear your ideas for uh, a topic that would be of interest, of interest to you, potentially of interest to the community. And generally speaking, I'll, I'll talk to you about it almost as soon as I get the DM. And we'll try and figure out if there's a kernel of an idea for a show. Uh, I will say this. Don't try and paint the Sistine Chapel with your idea. Ideally, you are painting, you know, about four feet by four foot area of that Sistine Chapel. And you want to do it really well. That's great. And, and that's the kind of topic we're looking for in this that usually goes 15 to 20 minutes. If you have something that's worthy of tremendous discussion, as Mark did here, we'll go longer on it. And we'll go down all the rabbit holes and really have fun with it. But ideally, I want to have some shorter content to attract new listeners to the show if you're trying to understand what my uh, motivations are. But anyway, uh, hope I hear from you uh, real soon, folks. Mark, thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate your time. Enjoyed the discussion a lot. We'll talk to you next time on Film Study.